Hello everyone, <clears throat> my name is Jesse Cordier. I'm one of the pediatric radiology attendings at UCSF. And I wanted to record this short video on intussusception reduction uh, for a few reasons. One, because this is a, uh, I think, an important diagnosis to be aware of, and it's a management I think is a good skill to have for any radiologist. Um, this is something that typically occurs um, really in the middle of the night, usually in the wee hours when um, the resident who's on call is typically uh, again, too overwhelmed or unable to, to join us and see how these are done when we're doing them. And again, they rarely happen during the working hours when our trainees are on service uh, with us during the day. In addition, I've been asked by you know, many a graduating fellow from neuro or AI about how to do these because going into private practice, there actually isn't the expectation that you'll be uh, knowledgeable and, and comfortable with being able to do these reductions um, as part of their call uh, call pool. Um, so I wanted to incorporate it for that purpose as well. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the how we diagnose these and my general approach uh, pre-procedure uh, pre preparation. We'll talk about the procedure itself and some potential complications and management of complications and a little bit about post-procedure counseling. Let's start with a typical clinical scenario and that is of a two-year-old male presents with dark stools and abdominal pain. And our standard of care examination for this uh, indication is, is an ultrasound. And we perform an ultrasound here in the right lower quadrant and we see a uh, classic target appearance here and the transverse image and on the longitudinal image here, a classic pseudo-kidney appearance. And again, this is classic intussusception. So we've diagnosed it. Let's talk a little bit about intussusception um, briefly. Again, this is typically from lymphoid hyperplasia. Um, uh, and uh, again, so in the large majority of children, there's no lead point. And up to 90%, there's no lead point. Uh, typical age range is between 5 to 10 months up to about 3 years. In general, if you see intussusception in a child who is six years or older, um, that is very suspicious for an underlying lead point, lymphoma, Meckel's diverticulum, something along those lines. Remember that intussusception is an emergent condition that can lead to bowel obstruction and necrosis. So it's something we have to come in and treat in the middle of the night. So uh, as I mentioned, lymphoid hyperplasia is the typical culprit in these children are our terminal ileum is an area that is rich in lymphoid follicles, and so the lower quadrant is an area where we often see intussusception. And what happens is we see uh, what an intussusception is, is the telescoped area of the bowel, referred as the intussusceptum, goes into the intussuscipians, the recipient. And as you can see, um, we get some vessels that get pinched off as a, as a result. And so what happens is telescoping of bowel, which leads to this constriction of bowel, which leads to bowel edema, which then leads to strangulation of bowel, which can lead to bowel necrosis, and if, again, untreated, could even lead to death. How do we diagnose this? Um, in general, radiographs have a poor sensitivity, only about 45%. What we're seeing here, I'm outlining, is the crescentic appearance of an intussusceptum on a uh, radiograph, again, something you very rarely see in real life. Ultrasound is a modality of choice for diagnosis with a sensitivity of 98 to 100 percent and specificity also very high. Again, this is operator dependent, but in the right hands can be very sensitive and specific. Here we're seeing a typical target appearance of an intussusception. As I mentioned, the right lower quadrant is your most common location, but you want to be sure to scan all four quadrants because as a trainee I've seen these extend all the way out to the right. As we mentioned, the ilio, uh, the terminal ilium is a common uh, starting point. We want to look at all areas because it really can't go all the way out. Some important things that you want to make sure that either you've assessed or the sonographer has assessed. One is the vascularity of the intussusceptum and intussuscipient. So Decreased blood flow, it's an overall predictor of an unsuccessful reduction. It is not an absolute contraindication to reduction, but it is, is helpful when I counsel the family and the surgeons about 
my chances of either successfully or unsuccessfully reducing the intussusception. Similarly, uh, presence of interloop fluid. Um, fluid within, uh, between these intussusceptum and intussuscipians is another predictor of an, an unsuccessful reduction. Again, it is not an absolute contraindication. There is an algorithm for treating intussusception. A little bit about that. So again, we begin with the ultrasound. The nice thing is, if we see no intussusception, we're done. So no need for a contrast enema or anything else afterwards if we are done and it has been repeated at UCSF. If we find other pathologic findings, that's also helpful. No enema required. They can, just, they can clinically reevaluate. If they see a lead point, this is something like a lymphoma or something like that, again, this will need clinical reevaluation. This is not a common scenario, but an intussusception in a critically ill child, a patient may go straight to surgery. Again, this is not something we commonly see, but this may occur. If we don't see any of those markers for failure, again, no interloop fluid, normal vascularity, symptoms for less than 24 hours, um, we will try our contrast enema with the maximum number of attempts. That means uh, three or more attempts. Again, if we're not successful, then we may go to surgery, but if we're successful, we can stop. And if we do see these markers for failure, however, symptoms greater than 24 hours is another one. Um, interloop fluid, decreased vascularity. We'll still perform the enema because we want to try to get the intussusception as close to anatomic position as possible because that will minimize the uh, length of the incision that the surgeon needs to make. If we're successful, that's great. Again, if, though we may need to go to surgery, Typically, they'll begin laparoscopically, trying to pull apart the intussusception. I have seen an open case, though, where they've had to actually do an open incision, and they physically just grab the two ends and pull them apart. So let's talk about how to prepare for the procedure. We can either do water-soluble contrast or air contrast enema. In general, national standard of care is air contrast reduction, so I'm going to be focusing on that. Uh, overall reasons for that are it's... Uh, Air has the most pushing power of the different types of uh, methods we have and uh, overall uses less radiation because the automatic exposure control in the fluoro tower isn't trying to penetrate through the contrast. So we'll talk about the pneumatic reduction. Some things that we want to have prior to beginning our procedure. One is a KUB. That's helpful to look for any large intraperitoneal air uh, prior, which is an absolute contraindication. Another absolute contraindication would be a sepsis, septic patient. Um, uh, we also The KUB is also sometimes helpful. If we see a lot of gas already, we may opt for water-soluble contrast to just for make things easy, to make things easier for us to see. Pediatric surgery consult is important. We want to make sure that they're aware of the case. I typically have the pediatric surgery resident uh, present during the procedure, it's good for them to be uh, there to see the case. Um, but in case we're unsuccessful or there's an emergency, uh, we want them to be aware of what's going on. Intravenous access, it's been shown to improve uh, success in reduction. Often these children are dehydrated, that mucus is very thick and if uh, within the bowel, and um, if you can uh, give them a little IV hydration, that does uh, help. And also, if they become uh, unstable, that's also helpful to already have access. And that leads us to monitoring of vitals. So we want to make sure that we have the vitals monitored. Someone is t uh, taking care of uh, uh, keeping an eye on the vitals in case they become unstable. What supplies do we want to have? Um, we want to have the tubing that comes in our uh, kit that is in the fluoro department with uh, the valve in place. An enema tip or a Foley catheter can also be used. The standard is the blue catheter. for I use Foley catheters for the smaller children. Usually uh, a 12 French Foley catheter is uh, uh, helpful in those situations. But there's also a pink tip for larger children. The pop-off valve, that prevents us from going over the uh, uh, maximum allowable pressure for reduction. So again, helpful um, if you're there by yourself or you're not able to, uh, you're not you're distracted and not able to completely look at that uh, temperature gauge while you're insufflating. The insufflator is uh, just as a blood pressure cuff. We just use this to puff, puff, puff and pump up the um, colon with air. 
We want to make sure that we have tape. We use, we prefer to use foam tape. It's uh, more of a water resistant tape and it's stretchable and helpful to uh, keep the buttocks taped together. This is what we use for taping the buttocks. An 18 gauge angiocath, we like to have this present in case of complication of tension pneumoperitoneum. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Position, where do we want everyone? Um, uh, I like to have the child positioned prone. Uh, the radiologist, I like to stand here, foot pedal here so that I can have two free hands. I like to have the technologist positioned here so that they can have a lead glove on and help keeping those uh, buttocks uh, squeezed together to make sure we have the best seal possible. And the parent or parents, I like to have them at the head of the bed to offer support and help with uh, keeping the child still uh, from up top. Placement of the cat. Um, in general, again, I like to have them in a prone position so that the tech can help with the uh, buttocks, keeping them uh, squeezed together. I also like to have this, this stretchy foam tape, one piece above, one piece below. I don't know if you can also appreciate that I've got this corner folded that makes the removal of the tape easier. We also, in the fluoro suite, have adhesive remover uh, for that. So, again, what are the magic numbers for insufflation? We want to keep it between 80 and 120 millimeters of mercury. We don't want to exceed that because that gets us into the risk for uh, perforation. So this is what it looks like. Remember, we've got the child prone. As we're insufflating, we're filling air. This crescentic defect is our intussusceptible. It's moving it along. Uh, questions come up, though. How long do we do this for? When do we stop? The question is, though, are you making any progress? Is this moving forward at all? Are you only moving a few centimeters? Uh, or are you moving uh, several centimeters each time you uh, insufflate? Usually, I'll keep insufflating as long as it moves. Once it stops moving, I'll do a pause for about three minutes, and then I'll try again. If it isn't budging, or if it's moving maybe one centimeter at most, um, that's when I'll, I'll stop at the third try. If, however, it looks like I'm still making progress, but it's just a little slow going, I may do four or five tries. This also partially depends on any of those findings that we talked about, the markers for an unsuccessful reduction. So if we're successful, we're going to see the deception move all the way down to the colon. And that tells us we're successful. So this is what we want to see is that gush of air going into the small bowel, knowing that we've gotten all the colonic material uh, back into its right place. Here's an area that we're moving. All of a sudden, we lose uh, pressure when we're pushing. It feels like we're just pushing against nothing, and we're seeing some lucency. And we, we shoot a real, real film here, and we see a large tension pneumoperitoneum. So what do we do? Well, this is what we want to have. We want to have the 18-gauge angiocath right there so we can immediately pre uh, decompress. Uh, ideally, we want to also have nearby some IV tubing with three-way stopcock and a 60cc syringe so that we can nicely remove the air uh, once we've gotten the angiocath in position. A question comes up, uh, where do we put the needle? So where we want it is two centimeters above the umbilicus. That's going to be your safest spot. You could also go two centimeters below, but in general, two centimeters above is the best spot. We just don't want to go on either side of it because of vessels. So uh, let's talk a little bit about procedure and counseling. I do tell the parents beforehand there's about a 5 to 10% risk of re intussusception within the first 24 hours. Patients are kept in house for this 24 hour period. If they present after reduction with pain, again, we some would say that you can just directly take them to fluoro because we know what it is. Um, my general preference is to just do a quick ultrasound to make sure, yes, that's what we're looking at, and go ahead and, and uh, take them to, re uh, to reduction again. Um, just a few things. There are a few other methods out there to do uh, to do this. Hydrostatic reduction is something that we've, we've done a few times. In general, our experience has been that it's not quite as efficient, not as fast as an air reduction but you are able to directly visualize the intussusception and that it goes away and that you see uh, contrast filling the small bowel loops. We verified this with some oral contrast, uh, positive contrast, uh, when doing the procedure. But it is successful. It is described in places. Our general experience is not as efficient as the air reduction. 
So a summary of the diagnostic features, again we're going to look for the targetoid or pseudo kidney appearance of bowel within bowel. Uh, again, we want to make sure that we look in all four quadrants, that that's documented, that we've looked at that. We want to look for any signs or predictors of an unsuccessful reduction, like absent vascularity or interleap fluid. These are helpful for us counseling both parents and surgeons. For the procedure itself, we want to make sure that while we're insufflating, we maintain a pressure between 80 and 120 millimeters of mercury. That pop-off valve is helpful to have in place in case we need to do that. Again, that directly that pop-up valve directly connects to the insufflation bulb. We want to try uh, three tries, but we can do more if we feel like we're making progress. However, if it's not budging on the uh, on the third try or only a few centimeters, that's when we may decide to stop. And if we run into a complication like tension pneumoperitoneum, we want to place our 18 gauge angiocath needle two centimeters above the umbilicus, and that's the ideal position. So we've talked about how to diagnose this, we've talked about how to prepare for it, the procedure and management of complications, and a little bit of post-procedure counseling. One last thing. So in the event of major catastrophe or a zombie apocalypse, there is one way we can reduce an antisusception, and that is with external manual reduction. This is actually a described technique, nothing that we've ever done or tried, but it is out there in the literature um, uh, it is actually out there in the literature um, as a described technique for manual reduction using these uh, uh, massaging maneuvers that they have. Um, again, not something in common practice, but just thought that I'd include that of interest. So thank you very much for your attention, guys. I really appreciate it, and I hope you uh, found this uh, valuable. Thanks.